वेलकम टू पार्टी स्ट्री Today we are going to discuss about Carolingian Renaissance. Historians traditionally refer to the court-directed educational and artistic reforms from roughly 790 to 870 as the Carolingian Renaissance. No more than a few thousand people participated in it and most of those were involved in preserving the achievements of earlier ages rather than undertaking original thought or creative action their activity deserves respect however without the copyists labor a great deal of classical latin literature would have disappeared and a world without virgil cicero tacitus suetonius or seneca the most popular roman authors in the middle ages would be a poorer place indeed keeping alive roman styles of architecture and design also helped to safeguard at least some of the classical tradition of mathematics and basic science standardizing the liturgy correcting literacy and ecclesiastical texts reforming orthography and creating a sound system of weights and measures all constituted genuine accomplishments poets like theodolf of orleans sidulius scotus wallafrit strabo wrote much supple and enduring verse scholars like the philosopher john scotus erigena and the canon lawyer known as pseudo isido made striking contribution to logic and ecclesiology new musical styles paintings techniques and literary genres emerged scriptoria flourished and first european libraries were established Silk weaving made its first appearance in the West and a surprisingly comprehensive network of monastic schools began to dot the European landscape. Considering the odds against them, on the whole, the artists and scholars of the Carolingian age did an admirable job. Whatever this Renaissance was or was not, It is clear that it began with Charlemagne who viewed educational reform as a central aspect of his vision for Christendom. The primary goal in other words was to reform the church to educate those illiterate peasant priests and half-taught monks who served the empire's churches and the ultimate end was not literature by which Charlemagne meant letters or learning in the broadest sense for its own sake but specifically in order to further the Christianization of the world. Charlemagne recalled that in order to interpret the holy scriptures one must have a command of correct language and a fluent knowledge of Latin. It was perhaps to meet this modest need that a school grew up within the precincts of the emperor's palace at Aachen. In order to develop and staff other centers of culture and learning, Charlemagne imported considerable foreign talent. The man chosen to lead this campaign was an Englishman named Alcuin. He came from York and he was a product of the vigorous Northumbrian monastic tradition that had produced earlier scholar monks like 
Saint Vede and Saint Boniface. Apart from overseeing the activities of all the court scholars, Alcuin devoted himself particularly to the enormous task of producing a new corrected edition of St. Jerome's Vulgate Bible. Thousands of scribal errors had crept into the text over the centuries. Alcuin gathered and collated as many manuscripts as possible from all over Europe and combed over the texts word by word. His mastery of Latin enabled him to eradicate obvious errors and in the process he not only produced a wholly new and accurate Bible but he also introduced an entirely new way of writing. He created a new alphabet called the Caroline Manuscule that was far more legible than earlier scripts. It is essentially his alphabet that is the letter shapes both upper and lower case that we are now reading. In a second innovation he introduced word spacing. The Romans aim had been in part to save space on expensive writing surface but it may have aided the Roman style of reading as well. In ancient times, reading was an oral activity. One pronounced the words as one read them. Alcuin reorganized medieval scribes who were supposed to observe silence at all times except when reciting the holy offices or when addressed by their abbot found Roman script too confusing and that this was one of the causes of the multitude of scribal errors. Alcuin's new writing system not only made it easier to produce reliable texts but it also resulted in a new way of reading that became increasingly a silent private pleasure rather than an oral communal one. Alcuin devised a course of study that was intended to train the clergy and the monks. Here we find the origins of the seven liberal arts. The trivium comprised grammar or how to write, rhetoric how to speak and logic how to think. While the quadrivium was made up of the mathematical arts like geometry, arithmetic, astronomy and music. Charlemagne and after him his son Louis the Pious recruited scholars from all across Europe. Einhard, Charlemagne's biographer, came from the eastern reaches of the Frankish territories. Paul the Deacon, a Lombard, produced a lively history of the Lombards that is one of our principal sources for the early history of that group. Two other Lombards, Peter of Pisa and Paulinus of Aquilia, were influential in consolidating and improving the grammars that became the standard for teaching monks their Latin. Paulinus also wrote a number of important treatises attacking the ideas of the last heresy known to have beset early medieval Europe, adoptionism, which maintained that the human figure of Christ as opposed to the eternal Christ who has always existed with God in heaven was the Son of God only in the sense that he was a man adopted by the Lord. Adoptionism emerged in Spain where it probably resulted from the influence of Islamic ideas about Christ, namely that he was a holy man inspired with divine prophetic gifts but was entirely and solely human in nature. Spain was also the birthplace of Theodulf a Visigoth who later rose to become Bishop of Orleans 
and then the abbot of Fleury. Theodulf, who was also no mean poet, was the principal author of the Libri Carolini, Charlemagne's response to the iconoclastic controversy. Sidulius Scotus came to the Frankish courts in the 840s from Ireland and wrote large quantities of accomplished verse and an irritating treatise called On Christian Rulers. Another Irishman, John Scotus Iriugena, was perhaps the most astonishing intellect of them all, even though he is seldom read today. He came to the court during the reign of Charlemagne's grandson, Charles the Bald, and somehow managed to learn Greek. His best-known work in the Middle Ages was a translation into Latin of a work called On the Celestial Hierarchies by Pseudo-Dionysius. This was a Neoplatonic work that attempted to describe the structural divisions of heaven, a kind of celestial architecture in which the author made fine distinctions between seraphim, cherubim and thrones, the higher angels of love, the dominations, powers and virtues or divine bureaucrats who watch out over the other angels and principalities, archangels and regular angels or God's messengers and occasional soldiers. It all sounds very fanciful but it illustrates an important conceptual understanding, the belief that the cosmos is structured that a blueprint exists for its design and that human beings by exercising their rational faculties can discern and comprehend the organization and purpose of the universe. John Scotus's most interesting original work was Verificium or On the Divisions of Nature, in which he elaborates his structural thesis about nature and the heavens. The world is an organic unity in John Scotus's thought and can only be properly understood as a system. His language is often difficult, which is one reason why he is so seldom read today but he was one of the first philosophers in Western history to posit a comprehensive system of natural laws. His philosophy emblematizes the whole Carolingian worldview and his influence on later medieval writers was considerable. Thanks to those foreigners who represented the areas where classical and Christian culture had been maintained in the 6th and 8th centuries, the court became a kind of academy to use Alcuin's term. There the emperor, his heirs and his friends discussed various subjects, the existence or non-existence of the underworld and of nothingness, the eclipse of the sun, the relationship of Father, Son and Holy Spirit, and so on. Recognizing the importance of manuscripts in the cultural revival, Charlemagne formed a library, the catalogue of which is still extant, had texts and books copied and recopied, and vede every school to maintain a scriptorium, by the 9th century, most monasteries had writing rooms or scriptoria. It was there that manuscripts were copied. It was now first necessary to correct any mistakes which had been made over years of copying. Charlemagne also standardized medieval Latin. So what Charlemagne did was take account of all these changes and includes them in a new scholarly language which we know as medieval Latin. Outside the court of Aachen, what we found here and there a few seats of culture, but not many. 
the Archbishop of Lyon reorganized the schools of readers and choir leaders. Alcuin in St. Martin de Tours and Angelbert in St. Ricoeur organized monastic schools with relatively well-stocked libraries. It was necessary to wait for the second generation or even the third to witness the greatest brilliance of the Carolingian renewal. Under Charlemagne's son Louis the Pious and especially under his grandsons, the monastic schools reached their apogee in France north of the Loire in Germany and in Italy. The most famous were the Saint Gaul, Rechnu, Fulda, Bobbio, Saint Denis, Saint Martin de Tours, and Ferrers. In the generations that followed Charlemagne, older books continued to be copied and it is worth mentioning that over 8000 manuscripts survived from Carolingian scriptoria, but precious few new books were written. Apart from the composition of saints' lives, this continued to flourish as a literary genre. The only significant intellectual accomplishments of the late 9th and 10th centuries were the compilation of encyclopedias like that of Ravenous Morus, which collected and preserved the ideas of others but advanced few of their own. Unfortunately, the breakup of the Carolingian Empire after the Treaty of Vaudan in 843 CE following local rebellions and the Viking invasions ended the progress of the Carolingian Renaissance. The Carolingian renewal centralized much of Europe's intellectual and cultural life by drawing grammarians, poets, artists, historians and scholars into the Frankish heartlands. Most of whatever original cultural activity took place happened in the imperial court, whether Aachen itself or the peripatetic retinue that always followed the emperor, and throughout the rest of the empire relatively little was accomplished apart from copying and reproduction. The results of this centralization were impressive since artists and intellectuals usually thrive in each other's presence, but centralization also meant the relative intellectual impoverishment of the non-Frankish territories. One of the most important consequences of the Carolingian Renaissance was that Charlemagne encouraged the spread of uniform religious practices as well as a uniform culture. Charlemagne set out to construct a Republica Christiana or Christian Republic. Despite the fact that Charlemagne unified his empire, elevated education, standardized coins and writing and even scholarly Latin, his empire declined in strength within a generation or two following his death in the year 814. Charlemagne has been represented as the sponsor or even creator of medieval education and the Carolingian Renaissance has been represented as the renewal of Western culture. This Renaissance, however, built on earlier episcopal and monastic developments and although Charlemagne did help to ensure the survival of scholarly traditions in the relatively bleak and rude age, there was nothing like the general advance in education that occurred later with the cultural awakening of the 11th and 12th centuries. Still, the Carolingian renewal deserves respect. It brought a degree of cohesiveness to Christian life 
that was badly needed and it also gave it a sense of purpose, a philosophic vision of how to order the world that had repercussions through many centuries. The great intellectual revival and cultural blossoming of the 12th and 13th centuries owed much to the often dreary labors of these Carolingian scribes. So this is the end of our today's discussion. Subscribe our channel and like our video and comment. Listen to our podcast episodes. Follow our official Facebook page, Twitter handle and Instagram. For any query, feel free to mail us. For details, see the description.